Disc 8. Three things then happened at once. The calming voice of announcer Ben Grauer started hawking hand lotion for the program's sponsor. The phone began to ring in the hallway outside my bedroom, as it never did after nine in the evening, and Sandy exploded. Addressing only the radio, but so passionately that my father was instantly roused from his living room chair, he began to shout, You filthy liar, you lying prick! Whoa! said my father, rushing into the kitchen. Not in this house. Not that language. That's enough. But how can you listen to this crap? What? Concentration camps? There are no concentration camps. Every word is a lie, bullshit, and more bullshit to get you people to tune in. The whole country knows Winchell's full of hot air. It's only you people who don't. And which people exactly is that, I heard my father say. I lived in Kentucky. Kentucky is one of the 48 states. Human beings live there like they do everywhere else. It is not a concentration camp. This guy makes millions selling his shitty hand lotion, and you people believe him? I told you already about the dirty words, and now I'm telling you about this you people business. You people. One more time, son, and I am going to ask you to leave the house. If you want to go live in Kentucky instead of here, I'll drive you down to Penn Station, and you can catch the next train out, because I know very well what you people means. And so do you. So does everyone, so don't you use those two words in this house ever again. Well, in my opinion, Walter Winchell is full of it. Fine, he said. That is your opinion, and you are entitled to it. But other Americans hold a different opinion. It so happens that millions and millions of Americans listen to Walter Winchell every single Sunday night, and they are not just what you and your brilliant aunt call you people. His program is still the highest-rated news show on the air. Franklin Roosevelt confided to Walter Winchell things he would never tell another newspaper man. And listen to me, will you? These are facts. But I can't listen to you. How can I listen to you when you tell me about millions of people? Millions of people are nothing but idiots. Meanwhile, my mother had answered the phone in the hall, and from my bed, I could now hear her speaking as well. Yes, she said, of course they had Winchell on. Yes, it was terrible. It was worse than they thought. But at least now it was out in the open. Yes, Herman would call as soon as the Winchell show was over. Four consecutive times she had this conversation. But when the phone rang a fifth time, she didn't jump to answer. Even though the caller had to have been another of their friends, shaken by Winchell's rapid-fire disclosures, she didn't answer because the commercial was finished and she and my father were back beside the radio in the living room. And Sandy was now in the bedroom where I pretended to be asleep while he got himself ready for bed by the nightlight, the small lamp with the pump handle switch that he had made from scratch in shop class back when he was merely an artistic boy engrossed by what he could fashion with his own skillful hands and blessedly uncontaminated by ideological battling. Our phone hadn't been used so incessantly so late at night since the death of my grandmother a couple of years back. It was close to eleven before my father had returned everyone's call, and another hour before my parents left the kitchen, where they'd been quietly conversing together and themselves went to bed. And it was another two hours after that before I could assure myself that they were sound asleep and that in the bed beside mine my brother was no longer glaring at the ceiling but was also asleep and that I could safely get up without being discovered and make my way to the back door and undo the lock and slip out of the flat and pad down the stairs into the cellar and, in the dark, steer myself barefoot across the dank floor to our storage bin. There was nothing impulsive or hysterical driving me, nothing melodramatic about my decision, nothing reckless that I could see. People said afterward, that they'd had no idea that beneath the fourth-grade patina of obedience and good manners, I could be such a surprisingly irresponsible, daydreaming child. But this was no shallow daydream. I wasn't playing at make-believe, and I wasn't making mischief for mischief's sake. As it turned out, the mischief-making with Axman had been valuable training, but undertaken for a purpose entirely different. I surely didn't feel as though I were rushing headlong into insanity, not even when I stood in the dark bin removing my pajamas and stepping into Selden's pants while at the same time mentally warding off the ghost of his father 
and trying not to be terrified by Alvin's empty wheelchair, I wasn't being swallowed up by anything other than the determination to resist a disaster our family and our friends could no longer elude and might not survive. Later, my parents said, he didn't know what he was doing, and sleepwalking became the official explanation. But I was fully awake, and my motivation never obscured to me. All that was obscure was whether I would succeed. One of my teachers suggested that I had been suffering from delusions of grandeur, inspired by what I was learning in school about the Underground Railroad organized before the Civil War to assist the slaves in making their way north to freedom. Not so. I wasn't at all like Sandy, in whom opportunity had quickened the desire to be a boy on the grand scale, riding the crest of history. I wanted nothing to do with history. I wanted to be a boy on the smallest scale possible. I wanted to be an orphan. There was only one thing I couldn't leave behind, my stamp album. Perhaps, if I could have been sure that it would be preserved undisturbed after I was gone, I wouldn't, at the last moment, on the way out of my bedroom, have stopped to open my dresser drawer and, as quietly as I could, lifted it from where it was stored, beneath my socks and my underclothes. But it was intolerable to think of my album ever being broken up or thrown out, or, worst of all, given away wholly intact to another boy. And so, I took it under my arm, and along with it the musket-shaped letter opener I'd bought at Mount Vernon whose beak of a bayonet I used to neatly slice open the only mail ever addressed to me, other than birthday cards, the packets of approvals sent regularly from Boston 17, Massachusetts by the world's largest stamp firm, H. E. Harris and Company. I remember nothing between my stealing out of the house and starting down the empty street toward the orphanage grounds and my waking up the next day to see my grim-faced parents at the foot of my bed, and to be told by a doctor busily extracting some kind of tube from my nose that I was a patient in Beth Israel Hospital, and that though I probably had a terrible headache, I was going to be all right. My head did hurt, excruciatingly, but it wasn't from a blood clot's putting pressure on the brain, a possibility they feared when I was found bleeding and unconscious, and not because there was brain damage, X-rays ruled out a skull fracture, and the neurological examination showed no damage to the nerves, other than a three-inch-long laceration requiring 18 stitches that were removed the following week. And the fact that I had no memory of the blow itself, nothing serious was wrong with me. A routine concussion, the doctor said. That's all that was causing the pain, as well as the amnesia. I'd probably never remember being kicked by the horse, or the series of events leading to that collision, but the doctor said that was routine too. Otherwise, my memory was intact, luckily. He used that word several times, and it sounded like ridicule in my aching head. They kept me for observation all that day, and overnight, rousing me just about every hour to be sure I didn't slip into unconsciousness again. And the next morning, I was discharged and instructed only to go easy with physical activities for a week or two. My mother had taken off from work to be with me at the hospital, and she was there to take me home on the bus. Because my head didn't stop hurting for some ten days, and because there was nothing to be done about it, I was kept home from school, but otherwise I was said to be fine. And fine thanks, primarily, to Selden, who from a distance had witnessed almost everything that I was unable to remember. If Selden hadn't sneaked out of bed when he had heard me coming down the back stairs, hadn't followed me in the dark, along Summit Avenue and across the high school playing field to the Goldsmith Avenue side of the orphanage and through the unlatched gate and into the orphanage woods, I probably would have lain there unconscious in his clothes until I bled to death. Selden ran all the way back to our house, woke my parents, who immediately dialed the operator for help and got in our car with them and directed them to the very spot where I was. It was by then close to three in the morning and pitch black, Kneeling beside me on the damp ground, my mother pressed a towel she brought with her against my head to staunch the bleeding, while my father covered me with an old picnic blanket that was in the trunk of the car and kept me warm until the ambulance arrived. My parents organized my rescue, but Selden Wishnow saved my life. I had, apparently, startled the two horses when, disoriented, 
I began stumbling about in the dark where the woods opened out into the farming field, and when I turned to try to escape the horses and make it back to the street through the woods, one of them reared up. I tripped and fell, and the other horse, in fleeing, nicked me with a hoof high on the back of my skull. For weeks, Selden recounted excitedly to me, and of course to the entire school, every detail of my nocturnal attempt to run away from home and be taken in by the nuns as a familyless child, in his telling, savoring particularly the mishap with the workhorses, as well as the fact that, outdoors, in the middle of the night, barefoot, and in just his pajamas, he had twice traversed the mile of abrasive terrain between the orphanage woods and our house. Unlike his mother and my parents, Selden couldn't get over the thrill of discovering that it wasn't he who had inexplicably lost his clothes, but I who had stolen them to use for my getaway. This utter improbability established as never before a value to his own existence that had previously escaped his attention. Telling the story with all the prestige of savior and co-conspirator both, and showing everyone who'd look at them his scraped feet, seemed to make Selden significant at last, even in his own eyes. A daredevil of a boy, able to compel a hero's attention for the first time in his life, while I was devastated. Not only by the shame of it all, which was more unbearable and longer-lasting than the headache, but because my stamp album, my greatest treasure, that which I could not live without, was gone. I didn't remember having taken it with me until the day after I got home from the hospital and got up in the morning to get dressed and saw that it was missing from beneath my socks and my underwear. The reason I stored it in there in the first place was so as to see it first thing every morning when I dressed for school. And now, the first thing I saw in my first morning home was that the biggest thing I had ever owned was gone. Gone and irreplaceable. Like, and utterly unlike, losing a leg. Ma, I shouted, Ma, something terrible happened. What is it, she cried and came running from the kitchen into my room. What's wrong? She thought, of course, that I'd begun to bleed from my stitches or that I was about to faint or that the headache was more than I could stand. My stamps... That's all I could say, and she was able to figure out the rest. What she did then was to go looking for them. All alone, she went into the orphanage woods and searched the ground where I'd been discovered, but she was unable to find the album anywhere. Found not so much as a single stamp. Are you sure you had them, she asked when she got home. Yes, yes, they're there, they have to be there. I can't lose my stamps. But I looked and looked. I looked everywhere. But who could have taken them? Where could they be? They're mine. We've got to find them. They're my stamps. I was inconsolable. I envisioned a horde of orphans spotting the album in the woods and tearing it apart with their filthy hands. I saw them pulling out the stamps and eating them and stomping on them and flushing them by the handful down the toilet in their terrible bathroom. They hated the album, because it wasn't theirs. They hated the album because nothing was theirs. Because I asked her to, my mother told neither my father nor my brother what had become of my stamps or about the money in Selden's pants. In the pocket when we found you, there were $19.50. I don't know where it came from, and I don't want to know. That episode is over and done with. I opened a savings account for you at the Howard Savings Bank. I deposited it for you there, for your future. Here, she handed me a little bank book with my name written inside it and $19.50, the first and only item stamped in black on the deposit page. Thank you, I said. And then she made the judgment of her second son that I believe she carried with her to her grave. You are the strangest child, she told me. I had no idea she said. I didn't begin to know. And then she handed me my letter opener, the miniaturized pewter musket from Mount Vernon. The stock was scratched and dirty and the bayonet bent slightly out of shape. She had found it that afternoon when, unknown to me, she had raced back from work at lunch hour and returned for a second time to comb through the soil of the orphanage woods, 
in search of the tiniest remnant of the stamp collection that had dissolved into thin air. Chapter 7 June 1942 to October 1942 The Winchell Riots The day before I discovered that my stamps were gone, I'd learned of my father's decision to quit his job. Only minutes after I got home from the hospital on Tuesday morning, he drove up to our house and into the alley in Uncle Monty's truck with the slatted wood sides and parked it there behind Mrs. Wishnow's car, having just finished his first night of work at the Miller Street Market. From then on, Sunday night through Friday morning, he'd come home at 9, 10 a.m., wash up, eat his big meal, go to bed, and be asleep by 11. And when I returned from school, I had to be careful not to slam the back door and wake him. A little before 5 in the afternoon, he'd be up and gone, because by about 6 or 7, the farmers began arriving at the market with their produce, and then anywhere from 10 p.m. to 4 in the morning, the retail grocers would be coming in to buy along with the restaurant owners and the hotel keepers and the last of the city's horse and wagon peddlers. He'd survive through the long night on the thermos of coffee and the couple of sandwiches my mother had prepared for him to take to work. On Sunday mornings, he'd visit his mother at Uncle Monty's, or Monty would bring her to the house to see us, and he'd spend the rest of Sunday sleeping, and again we'd have to be quiet so as not to disturb him was a hard life, especially since, on occasion, he had to drive out well before dawn to farmers in Passaic and Union counties and bring their produce in all by himself if Uncle Monty could get a better deal that way. I knew it was a hard life because when he got home in the morning, he'd have a drink. Ordinarily in our house, a bottle of Four Roses lasted for years. My mother... A caricature of a teetotaler couldn't stand the look of a foaming glass of beer, let alone the smell of straight whiskey. And when did my father ever take a drink, other than on their anniversary or when his boss came for dinner and he served him four roses on the rocks? But now, he would get home from the market and, before he changed out of his dirty clothes and took a shower, he'd pour the whiskey into a shot glass, tilt back his head, and take it down in one gulp, making the face of a man who'd just bit into a light bulb. Good, he'd say aloud. Good. Only then could he ease up enough to eat a full meal without getting indigestion. I was dumbfounded, and not only by the abrupt decline of my father's vocational status, not only by the truck in the alleyway and the thick-soled boots on the feet of a man who had previously gone off to work in a suit and tie and polished black shoes, not only by the preposterousness of his slugging down his shot and having his dinner alone at ten in the morning, but by my brother as well, by his unforeseen transformation. Sandy wasn't angry any longer. He wasn't contemptuous. He wasn't superior acting in any way. It was as though he, too, had taken a blow on the head, but one that, instead of bringing on amnesia, had rejuvenated the quiet, conscientious boy whose satisfactions emanated not from his being a precocious big shot full of contrary opinions, but from that strong, even current of an interior life that carried him steadily along from morning to night and that, in my eyes, had always made him genuinely superior to the other kids his age. Or perhaps it was that the passion for stardom, along with the capacity for conflict, had been spent. Perhaps he had never possessed the necessary egoism and was secretly relieved no longer having to be publicly stupendous. Or perhaps he just never believed in what he was supposed to be promulgating. Or perhaps, while I lay unconscious in the hospital with a possibly life-threatening hematoma, my father had given him the talking to that had done the trick. Or perhaps in the wake of the crisis I'd precipitated, he was merely concealing the stupendous self behind the old Sandy, masquerading, calculating, cleverly waiting and hiding until... until who knew what befell us next... At any rate, for now, the shock of circumstances had steered my brother back into the family fold. And my mother was no longer a working woman. There wasn't nearly what she'd hoped to accumulate in the Montreal savings account, but enough to get us across the border and started in Canada if we should have to flee at a moment's notice. She'd left her job at Haynes, no less expeditiously than my father had jettisoned the security of his 12-year affiliation with the Metropolitan, 
to foil the government's plans for our transfer to Kentucky and safeguard us against the anti-Semitic subterfuge that he, along with Winchell, understood Homestead 42 to be. She was back, running the household full-time, and would once again be there when we came home for lunch and got home from school. And during the summer vacation, she'd be there to monitor Sandy and me so that we didn't again spin out of control owing to lack of supervision. A father remodeled, a brother restored, a mother recovered, 18 black silk sutures stitched in my head and my greatest treasure irretrievably lost, and all with a wondrous fairy tale swiftness. A family both declassed and rerouted overnight, facing neither exile nor expulsion, but entrenched still on Summit Avenue, whereas in three short months, Selden, to whom I was helplessly yoked now that he was going around the neighborhood, reveling in having prevented me from bleeding to death while disguised in his clothes, Selden was shipping out. As of September 1st, Selden would be off living with his mother, the only Jewish kid in Danville, Kentucky. My sleepwalking would likely have caused an even more humiliating scandal than it did in our immediate locale had not Walter Winchell been fired by Jergen's lotion only hours after coming off the air on the Sunday night that I'd run away. There was the truly shocking news that nobody could believe and that Winchell wasn't about to let the country forget. After ten years as America's leading radio reporter, he was replaced at 9 p.m. the following Sunday by yet another dance band broadcasting from yet another sophisticated supper club on the terrace of a midtown Manhattan hotel. Jergen's first charge against him was that a broadcaster with a weekly nationwide audience of more than 25 million had essentially cried fire in a crowded theater. The second was that he had slandered a president of the United States with malicious accusations that only the most outrageous demagogue would contrive to arouse the passions of the mob. Even the moderate New York Times, a paper founded and owned by Jews and highly esteemed for that reason by my father, and by no means uncritical of Lindbergh's policy toward Hitler's Germany, announced its unqualified support of the action taken by Jurgen's lotion in an editorial entitled A Professional Disgrace. A competition has been in progress for some time, wrote the Times, among anti Lindbergh entrepreneurs to determine who can produce the most outrageous accounts of the motives of the Lindbergh administration. With one bombastic stride, Walter Winchell has moved to the head of the pack. The borderline scruples and questionable taste of Mr. Winchell have tumbled over into an outburst of vitriol that is as unpardonable as it is unethical with accusations so far-fetched that even a lifelong Democrat may find himself feeling unexpected sympathy for the president, Winchell has disgraced himself irredeemably. Jurgen's lotion is to be commended for the speed with which it has removed him from the airwaves. Journalism, as it is practiced by the Walter Winchells of this country, is an insult as much to our enlightened citizenry as to the journalistic standards of accuracy, fairness, and responsibility, toward which Mr. Winchell, his cynical tabloid cohorts, and their money-hungry publishers have always displayed the utmost contempt. In a subsequent attack delivered in behalf of the Lindbergh administration, and published by the Times as the first and lengthiest of the letters elicited by its editorial, one eminent correspondent, after alluding gratefully to the editorial, and reinforcing its argument by further examples of Winchell's ostentatious abuse of the First Amendment, concluded, The attempt to inflame and frighten his fellow Jews is no less detestable than the disregard for the norms of decency that your paper so forcefully condemns. Certainly, nothing is so heinous as preying upon the historical fears of a persecuted people, particularly when full participation in an open society free of oppression is precisely what the present administration is working to achieve for the same group through the efforts of the Office of American Absorption. For Walter Winchell to characterize Homestead 42, a program designed to broaden and enrich the involvement of America's proud Jewish citizens in the national life as a fascistic strategy to isolate Jews and exclude them from the national life, is the height of journalistic recklessness and an illustration of the big lie technique 
that is today the greatest threat to democratic freedom everywhere. The letter was signed Rabbi Lionel Bengelsdorf, Director, Office of American Absorption, Department of the Interior, Washington, D.C. Winchell's response came in the column he wrote for the Daily Mirror, the New York paper belonging to America's wealthiest publisher, William Randolph Hearst, who owned a chain of some 30 right-wing papers and a half a dozen popular magazines, as well as King Features, where Winchell was syndicated and read by many millions more. Hearst despised Winchell's political allegiances, particularly his glorification of FDR, and would have fired him years earlier had it not been that the very New Yorkers for whose nickels the mirror competed against the Daily News found irresistible the gutter charm of the columnist's singular concoction of muckraking contentiousness and cloying patriotism. According to Winchell, why Hearst finally did fire him had less to do with the long-standing animosity between the columnist and his publisher than with the pressure from the White House that even a ruthless old tycoon as powerful as Hearst could not dare to resist for fear of the consequences. The Lindbergh fascists, so began the characteristically brazen, unregenerate Winchell column, published just days after he lost his radio contract, have openly begun their Nazi assault on freedom of expression. Today, Winchell's the enemy to be silenced. Winchell, the warmonger, the liar, the alarmist, the commie, the kike. Today, yours truly, tomorrow, every newscaster and reporter who dares to tell the truth about the fascist plot to destroy American democracy. Honorary Aryans, like the rabid rabbi, Lion Lionel B., and the snooty Park Avenue proprietors of the gutless New York Times, aren't the first ultra-civilized Jewish quislings to grovel before an anti-Semitic master because they're just too, too refined to fight like Winchell. And they won't be the last. The jerks at Jurgens aren't the first corporate cowards to play ball with the dictatorial lying machine that is now ruining this country, and they won't be the last, either. And that column, which proceeded to list some 15 more of his personal enemies who qualified as America's leading fascist collaborators, was, in fact, to be his last. Three days later, after visiting Hyde Park, to make certain that FDR was still determined not to come out of political retirement to run for a third term, Winchell announced his candidacy for President of the United States in the next general election. Until then, those considered in the running were Roosevelt's Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, the former Secretary of Agriculture and the vice presidential candidate on the 1940 ticket, Henry Wallace. Roosevelt's Postmaster General and the Chairman of the Democratic Party, James Farley, Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, and two middle-of-the-road Democrats, neither of them New Dealers, former Indiana Governor Paul V. McNutt and Senator Scott W. Lucas of Illinois. It was also an unconfirmed report, circulated and perhaps originated by Winchell, back when he was still making $800,000 a year circulating unconfirmed reports, that should the convention wind up deadlocked, as could easily happen with so unexciting a slate of candidates, Eleanor Roosevelt, a forceful political and diplomatic presence during her husband's two terms, and still a popular figure whose blend of outspokenness and aristocratic reserve had gained her an enormous following among the party's liberal constituency, as well as numerous mocking enemies in the right-wing press, would appear on the convention floor the way Lindbergh did at the 1940 Republican convention, and sweep the nomination by acclamation. But once Walter Winchell became the first Democratic candidate to enter the race, and to do so almost 30 months in advance of the 44 election, in advance even of the midterm congressional elections, and to do so immediately after the noisy fracas that resulted from his having been purged from his profession by the strong-arm push tactics of the fascist gang in the White House, as Winchell described his enemies and their methods in announcing his candidacy, the one-time gossip columnist became the man to beat, the only Democrat with a name known to everyone and audacious enough to assault with ferocity an incumbent as beloved as Lindy. Republican leaders didn't deign to take Winchell seriously, assuming either that the irrepressible performer was putting on a self-glorifying sideshow to suck a funds out of a handful of rich diehard Democrats, or that he was a flamboyant stalking horse for FDR, 
or perhaps for Roosevelt's ambitious wife, at once stirring up and measuring whatever underground anti Lindbergh sentiment might possibly exist in a nation where polls showed that Lindbergh continued to be supported by a record 80 to 90 percent of every classification and category of voter except the Jews. Winchell, in short, was the candidate of the Jews, and himself a Jew of the coarsest type, in no way resembling the inner circle of well-bred, dignified Jewish Democrats like Roosevelt's wealthy financier friend Bernard Baruch, or the banker and New York governor Herbert Lehman, or the recently retired Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis. And as if being a Jew of no background who embodied just about every vulgar trait that made Jews less than welcome in the better strata of American social and business society weren't enough to render him an irrelevant impertinence on the political scene anywhere other than the heavily Jewish precincts of New York City, there was his reputation as an adulterous philanderer, with a penchant for seducing long-legged showgirls in his profligate nightlife among the loose-living Hollywood and Broadway celebrities who drank to all hours at New York's store club to make him anathema to the straight-laced multitude. His candidacy was a joke, and the Republicans treated it as nothing more. But on our street that week, in the immediate aftermath of the firing of Winchell and his instantaneous resurrection as a presidential candidate, the significance of the two events was almost all that the neighbors could talk about among themselves. After nearly two years of never knowing whether to believe the worst, of trying to focus on the demands of their day-to-day -day lives, and then helplessly absorbing every rumor about what the government had in store for them, of never being able to justify either their alarm or their composure with hard fact, after so much perplexity, they were so ripe for delusion that, when the parents gathered on their beach chairs to chat together in the alleyways at night, the guessing game that invariably started up could go on without let-up for hours. Who would be vice president on the Winchell ticket? Whom would he appoint to his cabinet? Whom would he appoint to the Supreme Court? Who would turn out to be the greater leader, FDR or Walter Winchell? They plunged headlong into a thousand fantasies, and the very small children also caught the spurt and went skipping and dancing about chanting, Windshield for President. Wind shield for president. Of course, that no Jew could ever be elected to the presidency. Least of all, a Jew with a mouth as unstoppable as Winchell's. Even a kid as young as I was already accepted, as if the prescription were laid out in so many words in the U.S. Constitution. Yet not even that ironclad certainty could stop the adults from abandoning common sense and, for a night or two, imagining themselves and their children as native-born citizens of paradise. The wedding of Rabbi Bengelsdorf and Aunt Evelyn took place on a Sunday in the middle of June. My parents were not invited, nor did they expect or want to be, and yet nothing could be done to ease my mother's distress. I'd overheard her crying from behind her bedroom door before, and though it wasn't a usual occurrence or one I liked, in all the months during which my parents struggled to assess the menace posed by the Lindbergh administration, and to determine the response sensible for a Jewish family to take, I'd never known her to be so inconsolable. Why does this have to happen to, she asked my father. They're only getting married, he told her. It isn't the end of the world. But I can't stop thinking about my father, she said. Your father died, he said. My father died. They weren't young men. They got sick, and they died. It would have been hard to imagine a tone any more sympathetic than his, but her misery was such that the gentler his voice, the worse she suffered. And I think, she said about my mother, how Mama wouldn't know what to make of anything anymore. Honey, it could all be a lot more terrible, you know that. And it will be, my mother said. Maybe not, maybe not. Maybe everything is starting to change. Winchell, oh, please, Walter Winchell won't. Shh, shh, he said to her, the little one. And so I understood that Walter Winchell wasn't, in fact, the candidate of the Jews. He was the candidate of the children of the Jews, something we were being given to clutch at, the way not too many years before we'd been given the breast not merely for nutrients, but for the alleviation of babyhood spheres. The wedding ceremony was held at the rabbi's temple, 
and reception afterward in the ballroom of the Essex House, Newark's most luxurious hotel. The notables who attended, each accompanied by a wife or a husband, were listed inside a box separate from the wedding story itself and directly beside photographs of the bride and groom that appeared in the Newark Sunday Call. The list was surprisingly long and impressive, and I presented here to explain why I, for one, had to wonder if my parents and their metropolitan friends weren't completely out of touch with reality to imagine that any harm could befall them because of a government program being administered by a luminary of the stature of Rabbi Benkelsdorf. To begin with, there were Jews in abundance at the wedding ceremony, among them family and friends, congregants from Rabbi Benkelsdorf's temple, admirers and colleagues from around New Jersey, and others who had traveled from all over the country to be present. And many Christians were there as well. And, according to the article in the Sunday Call, which took up one and a half of the two society pages that day, among the several invited guests unable to attend, but who sent their best wishes through Western Union, was the wife of the president, the First Lady Anne Morrow Lindbergh, identified as a close friend of the rabbis, a fellow New Jerseyite and a fellow poet, with whom he shared cultural and intellectual interests, and who met with him frequently over afternoon tea for a White House tete-a-tete to discuss philosophy, literature, religion, and ethics. Representing the city were the two highest-ranking Jews ever in Newark's government, the two-term ex-mayor, Meyer Ellenstein, and the city clerk, Harry S. Reichenstein, and five of the slew of Irishmen currently most prominent in the city, the director of public safety, the director of the Department of Revenue and Finance, the director of parks and public property, the city's chief engineer, and the corporation council. Newark's federal postmaster was there, and the head librarian of the Newark Public Library, as well as the president of the library's board of trustees. Among the distinguished educators attending the wedding were the president of the University of Newark, the president of Newark College of Engineering, the superintendent of schools, and the headmaster of St. Benedict's Prep, and an array of distinguished clergymen, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish, were also among those present. From the First Baptist Petty Memorial Church, the city's largest Negro congregation, there was the Reverend George E. Dawkins. From Trinity Cathedral, Reverend Arthur Dumper. From Grace Episcopal Church, Reverend Charles L. Gumpf. From St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church on High Street, Reverend George E. Spiridakis. And from St. Patrick's Cathedral, the very Reverend John Delaney. Absent, and glaringly so to my parents, though nowhere alluded to in the newspaper story, was Rabbi Bengelsdorf's antagonist, and the foremost of Newark's rabbis, Joachim Prince of Congregation B'nai Abraham. Before Rabbi Bengelsdorf's rise to national prominence, Rabbi Prince's authority among Jews throughout the city, in the wider Jewish community, and among scholars and theologians of every religion, had far exceeded his elder colleagues, and it was he alone of the conservative rabbis leading the city's three wealthiest congregations who had never flinched in his opposition to Lindbergh. The other two, Charles L. Hoffman of Oheb Shalom and Solomon Foster of Bnei Jeshrun, were in attendance, however, and Rabbi Foster presided over the wedding ceremony. Present as well were the presidents of Newark's four major banks, the presidents of two of its largest insurance companies, the president of its biggest architecture firm, the two founding partners of its most prestigious law firm, the president of the Newark Athletic Club, the owner of three of the big downtown movie houses, the president of the Chamber of Commerce, the president of New Jersey Bell Telephone, the editors-in-chief of the two daily papers, and the president of P. Ballantyne, Newark's most famous brewery. From the Essex County government, there was the supervisor of the Board of Freeholders and three members of the board. And from the New Jersey Judiciary, with the Vice Chancellor of the Court of Chancery and an Associate Justice from the State Supreme Court. From the State Assembly, there was the Majority Speaker and three of the four Assemblymen from Essex County, and from the State Senate, a representative from Essex County. The ranking State official was a Jew, Attorney General David T. Willens, who had successfully led the prosecution of Bruno Hauptmann. But the State official whose presence most impressed me was Abe J. Green, another Jew, but more importantly, New Jersey's boxing commissioner. 
One of Jersey's two U.S. senators was there, the Republican W. Warren Barber, as was our Congressman Robert W. Keene. From the District Court of the United States for the District of New Jersey, there was a circuit judge, two district judges, and the district attorney, whose name I recognized from listening to gangbusters, John J. Quinn. A number of close associates of the rabbi at the national headquarters of the OAA and several officials representing the Department of the Interior had come up from Washington, and though there was nobody at the wedding from the very highest echelons of the federal government, there was an eloquent proxy representing no less a personage than the president himself. The telegram from the First Lady that was read aloud by Rabbi Foster at the reception, after which reading, the wedding guests rose spontaneously to applaud the First Lady's sentiments and were then asked by the groom to remain standing and to join with him and his bride in singing the national anthem. The lengthy text of the telegram was carried in full by the Sunday call. It went as follows. My dear Rabbi Bengelsdorf and Evelyn, my husband and I send you our heartfelt best wishes and we join in wishing you the most blissful happiness. We were delighted to have an opportunity to meet Evelyn at the White House State Dinner for the German Foreign Minister. She is an enchanting, energetic young woman, clearly a most worthy and upright person, and it took no more than the few moments I spent chatting with her for me to recognize the gifts of personality and intellect that won her the devotion of a man as extraordinary as Lionel Bengelsdorf. I recall today the splendidly succinct lines of poetry my meeting with Evelyn brought to mind that evening. The poet is Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and the words with which she begins the fourteenth of her sonnets from the Portuguese embody just such womanly wisdom as I saw emanating from Evelyn's astonishingly dark and beautiful eyes. If thou must love me, wrote Mrs. Browning, let it be for naught, except for love's sake only. Rabbi Bengelsdorf, you have been more than a friend since we met here in the White House after the ceremony establishing the Office of American Absorption. Since you are moving to Washington to become OAA director, you have been an invaluable mentor. Our engrossing conversations, along with the enlightening books you have generously given me to read, have taught me much, not just about the Jewish faith, but about the tribulations of the Jewish people and the sources of the great spiritual strength which has been the mainspring of their survival for 3,000 years. I am all the richer for having discovered through you how profoundly rooted my own religious heritage is in yours. Our greatest mission as Americans is to live in harmony and brotherhood as a united people. I know from the excellent work you are both doing for the OIA how dedicated the two of you are to helping us achieve this precious goal. Of the many blessings bestowed upon our nation by God, none is more valuable than our having among us citizens like yourselves, proud vital champions of an indomitable race whose ancient concepts of justice and freedom have sustained our American democracy since 1776. With every best wish, Anne Morrow Lindbergh. The second time the FBI entered our lives, it was my father who was under surveillance. The same agent who'd stopped to question me about Alvin on the day that Mr. Wish now hanged himself and who'd questioned Sandy on the bus, my mother at the store and my father at the office, showed up at the produce market and hung around the diner where the men would go to eat and get coffee in the middle of the night, and behaving as he'd done when Alvin began working for Uncle Monty, started asking around now about Alvin's Uncle Herman and what he was saying to people about America and our president. Word got back to Uncle Monty through one of Longy's Wilman's henchmen who passed on to Uncle Monty what Agent McCorkle had reported to him Namely, that after having housed and fed a trader who fought for a foreign country, my father had now quit a good job with Metropolitan Life rather than participate in a government program designed to unify and strengthen the American people. Uncle Monty told Longy's guy that his brother was a poor schnook with no education who had two kids and a wife to support and couldn't do much harm to America by schlepping produce crates six nights a week. And Longy's guy listened sympathetically according to Uncle Monty, who, with none of the decorum ordinarily practiced in our house, told us the whole story in our kitchen one Saturday afternoon, and still, the guy says to me, your brother's got to go. 
So I told him, this is all bullshit. Tell Longy this is all part of the bullshit against Jews. And the guy is himself a Jew, Niggy Apfelbaum. But what I say does not make a dent. Niggy goes back to Longy, and he tells him, Raw, don't do as he's told. What happens next? The long one himself shows up, right there in my stinky little office and wearing a silk handmade suit. Tall, soft-spoken, dressed to kill. You see how he gets the movie stars. I said to him, I remember you from grade school, Longy. I could see even then you were going places. So Longy says to me, I remember you too. I could see even then you were going nowhere. We started to laugh, and I told him, my brother needs a job, Longy. Can I not give my own brother a job? And can I not have the FBI snooping around, he asked me. I know all this, I say. And didn't I get rid of my nephew, Alvin, because of the FBI? But with my own brother, it's not the same, is it? Look, I tell him, 24 hours and I'll fix everything. If I don't, if I can't, Herman goes. So I wait till after we close up the next morning, and I walk over to Sammy Eagles, and sitting at the bar is the Mick Schmageggy from the FBI. Let me buy you breakfast, I tell him. And I order him a boiler maker, and I sit down next to him and say, What do you got against the Jews, McCorkle? Nothing, he says. Then why are you after my brother like this? What did he do to anybody? Look, if I had something against Jews, would I be sitting here in Eagles? Would Sammy Eagle be my friend if I did? He calls down the bar for Eagle to come over. Tell him, McCorkle says. Do I have anything against Jews? Not that I know, Eagle says. When your boy had the bar mitzvah, didn't I come and give him a tie clasp? He still wears it, Eagle tells me. See, McCorkle says, I'm just doing my job. The way Sammy does his and you do yours. And that's all my brother is doing, I tell him. Fine, good. So don't say I'm against the Jews. My error, I tell him. I apologize. And meantime, I slip him the envelope, the little brown envelope, and that's that. Here my uncle turned to me and said, I understand you were a horse thief. I understand you stole a horse from the church. Smart boy, let me see. I leaned over and showed him where the horse's hoof had opened up my head. He laughed when he ran his finger lightly over the length of the scar and around the shaved patch where the hair was just growing in. May you have many more, he told me. And then, as he'd been doing for as long as I could remember, he lifted me roughly onto one of his knees so that I could straddle it like, of all things, a horse. You've been to a bris, ain't you? he asked, and began to give me the up-and-down ride by raising and lowering his thigh. You know when they circumcise the baby at the bris? You know what they do, don't you? They cut off the foreskin, I said. And what do they do with the little foreskin? After it's off, do you know what they do? No, I told him. Well, said Uncle Monty, they save them up, and when they got enough, they give them to the FBI to make agents out of. I couldn't help myself, and even though I knew I wasn't supposed to, and even though the last time he told me the joke, he said they'd send them to Ireland to make priests out of, I began to laugh. What was in the envelope? I asked him. Take a guess, he said. I don't know. Money? Money is right. You're a bright little horse thief. The money that makes all trouble go away. Only later did I learn from my brother, who'd overheard my parents talking in their bedroom, that the full amount of the bribe given to McCorkle was to be repaid to Uncle Monty out of my father's already paltry paycheck at the rate of $10 per week over the next six months. And my father could do nothing about it, about the laboriousness of the work, about the mortifications attendant upon serving his brother, all he ever said was, he's been this way since he's ten years old, he'll be this way till he dies. Aside from Saturdays and Sunday mornings, my father was hardly to be seen that summer. My mother, on the other hand, was now around all the time, and since Sandy and I had to be home at noon for lunch and again in the mid-afternoon to check in with her and be accounted for, neither of us could stray very far and in the evenings we were forbidden to go anywhere beyond the school playing field a block from the house. Either my mother was keeping a very strict vigil over herself, or she'd managed temporarily to make peace with all her chagrin, because though my father had taken a steep pay cut and the household budget required some difficult trimming, she showed no disabling signs of the improbability she confronted over the past year. Her resilience had a lot to do with her being back at a job whose compensations mattered more to her than those derived from selling dresses, work she hadn't shrunk from doing, 
but that seemed to her meaningless, measured against her normal pursuits. Just how troubling her worries continued to be would only be clear to me when a letter arrived from Estelle Churchwell reporting on the family's progress in Winnipeg. Every lunchtime, I brought the mail upstairs with me from our mailbox in the front entryway, and if there was an envelope bearing Canadian postage, she immediately sat down at the kitchen table and, while Sandy and I ate our sandwiches, read the letter to herself twice over, then folded it up to carry around in her apron pocket to look at another ten times, before passing it on to my father to read when he got up to go to the market. The letter for my father, the cancelled Canadian stamps for me, to help me get started on a new collection. Sandy's friends were suddenly the girls his age, the teenage girls whom he knew from school but had never examined so covetously before. He went to find them at the playground, where the organized summer activities took place all day and into the early evening. I was there, too, accompanied regularly now by Selden. I'd watched Sandy with fluctuating feelings of trepidation and delight, as though my own brother had become a pickpocket or a professional shill. He'd park himself on a bench near the ping-pong table, where the girls tended to congregate, and he started making pencil drawings in a sketch pad of the cutest around. Invariably, they'd want to see the drawings, and so before the day was over, chances were good he'd be walking dreamily out of the playground hand in hand with one of them. Sandy's strong proclivity for infatuation was no longer galvanized by propagandizing for just folks, or topping tobacco for the Mawinnies but fomented by these girls. Either the fresh excitement of desire had transformed his existence with the same incredible swiftness that Kentucky had, and at fourteen and a half, he'd been recast anew in a single hormonal blast or, as I believed, with my own proclivity to grant him omnipotence, getting girls to go off with him was simply an amusing ruse, how he was binding his time until... Always with Sandy, I thought, there must be a great deal more going on than I could begin to understand, when, in fact, despite the handsome boy's air of self-assurance, he had no more idea than anyone else why he took the bait. Lindbergh's Jewish tobacco farmer discovers breasts, and suddenly he turns up as just another teenager. My parents ascribed the girl craziness to defiance, to rebelliousness, to a compensatory display of independence following his forced retirement from the Lindbergh cause and seemed willing to consider it relatively harmless. One of the girl's mothers felt otherwise, evidently, and called to say so. When my father got home from work, there was a long conversation between my mother and father behind their bedroom door, and then another between my brother and my father behind the bedroom door, and for the rest of the week, Sandy was not allowed to leave the vicinity of the house. But they couldn't, of course, keep him cooped up on Summit Avenue for the whole of the summer, and soon he was back at the playground, confidently drawing pictures of the pretty ones, and whatever these girls allowed him to do with his hands when they went off by themselves, which couldn't have been much for eighth graders, as ignorant of sex as kids that young were back in those years. They didn't rush home to report, and so there were no more excited phone calls for my parents to contend with in the midst of all their other troubles. Selden. Selden was my summer. Selden's muzzle in my face like a dog's, and kids I'd known all my life laughing and calling me sleepy. Kids with their arms raised stiffly out in front of them and walking with slow, clumpy, zombie steps, supposedly an imitation of me lurching toward the orphanage in my sleep, and the team in the field all chanting, hi Silver, whenever I came to bat in a choose-up game. There would be no big end-of-summer picnic up at the South Mountain Reservation on Labor Day that year, because all of my parents' metropolitan friends had left Newark with their boys by September to settle in around the country before the start of the school year. One by one throughout that summer, each of the families drove up on a Saturday to visit and say goodbye. It was awful for my parents, who, alone of the group from the local metropolitan district designated for relocation by Homestead 42, had chosen to stay where we were. These were their dearest friends, and the hot Saturday afternoons with the tearful adults embracing out on the street while all the children forlornly looked on, afternoons that ended with the four of us who were remaining behind, waving goodbye from the curb, as my mother called after the departing car, Don't forget to write, were the most harrowing moments so far when our defenselessness became real to me and I sensed the beginning of the destruction of our world. 
and when I realized that my father, of all these men, was the most obstinate, helplessly bonded to his better instincts and their excessive demands. I only then understood that he had quit his job not merely because he was fearful of what awaited us down the line should we agree, like the others, to be relocated, but because, for better or worse, when he was bullied by superior forces that he deemed corrupt, it was his nature not to yield. In this instance, to resist either running away to Canada, as my mother had urged our doing, or bowing to a government directive that was patently unjust. There were two types of strong men. Those like Uncle Monty and Abe Steinheim, remorseless about their making money, and those like my father, ruthlessly obedient to their idea of fair play. Come, my father said, trying to perk us up on the Saturday when the last of the six homesteading families had seemingly vanished forever. Come on, boys, go and add for ice cream. The four of us walked down Chancellor to the drugstore, where the pharmacist was one of his oldest insurance customers, and where in summertime it was generally more pleasant than it was out on the street, what with the awnings unfurled to prevent the sun's rays from piercing the plate glass window and the paddle blades of the three ceiling fans creaking softly as they revolved overhead. We slipped into a booth and ordered Sundays, and though my mother could not bring herself to eat despite my father's prompting, she was able eventually to stop the tears from running down her face. We, after all, were no less enjoying to an unknowable future than were our exiled friends, and so we sat spooning our Sundays in the awninged semi-darkness of the cool pharmacy everyone speechless and completely spent, until my mother at last looked up from the paper napkin she was neatly shredding and, with that wry, stripped-down smile that comes when one is entirely cried out, said to my father, Well, like it or not, Lindbergh is teaching us what it is to be Jews. Then she added, We only think we're Americans. Nonsense. No, my father replied. They think we only think we're Americans. It's not up for discussion, Bess. It's not up for negotiation. These people are not understanding that I take this for granted, goddammit. Others. He dares to call us others. He's the other. The one who looks most American, and he's the one who's least American. The man is unfit. He shouldn't be there. He shouldn't be there, and it's as simple as that. For me, the hardest departure to stomach was Selden's. Of course, I was delighted to see him go. All summer long I'd been counting the days, yet that early morning in the last week of August, when the Wishnows drove off with two mattresses strapped to the car roof, lifted there and tied down beneath the top the night before by my father and Sandy, and clothing jammed to the top of the old Plymouth's back seat, stacks of clothing, including several items of my own that my mother and I had helped them to carry from the house. I was the one, grotesquely enough, who couldn't stop crying. I was remembering an afternoon when Selden and I were just six years old, and Mr. Wishnow was alive and seemingly well and still working every day for the Metropolitan, and Mrs. Wishnow was still a housewife like my mother, absorbed by her family's everyday needs and, even on occasion, looking after me if my mother had to be off doing her PTA work and Sandy wasn't around and I was home by myself after school. I was remembering the generic maternalism that she shared with my mother, the suckering warmth I wallowed in as a matter of course, and that I experienced so strikingly on the afternoon that I got stuck in their bathroom and couldn't get out. I was remembering how kind she'd been to me while I repeatedly tried and failed to open the door, spontaneously caring for me as though, regardless of differences in appearance and temperament and immediate circumstance, the four of us, Selden and Selma, Philip and Bess, were all one and the same. I was remembering Mrs. Wishnow when what was uppermost in her mind was what was uppermost in my mother's mind, back when she was just another watchful member of the local matriarchy whose overriding task was to establish a domestic way of life for the next generation. I was remembering Mrs. Wishnow unperturbed when her fists weren't clenched and her face full of pain. It was a small bathroom, exactly like ours, quite confining, the door next to a toilet and the toilet abutting a sink and a bathtub squeezed in beside that, I pulled on the door, but it didn't open. At home, I would have just closed it behind me, but at the Wishnows, I locked it, something I'd never done before in my life. I locked it, and I peed, and I flushed, and I washed my hands, and because I didn't want to touch their towel, wiped them dry on the back of the legs of my corduroys. 
Everything was fine, and then I went to exit the bathroom, and I couldn't undo the lock above the doorknob. I could turn it a little ways, but then it would catch and stop. I didn't bang on the door or rattle the doorknob. I just kept trying to turn the lock as quietly as I could, but it wouldn't go. And so I sat back down on the toilet, and I thought that maybe it would somehow work itself out. I sat there for a while, but then I got lonesome, and I stood up and tried the lock again. It still wouldn't uncatch, and I started to knock lightly on the door, and Mrs. Wish now came and said, Oh, the lock on the door does that sometimes. You have to turn it like this. She explained how to do it, but I still couldn't get it open. And so very calmly she said, No, Philip, while you're turning it, you have to pull it back. And though I tried to do, as she told me, it still didn't work. Dear, she said, turn and back simultaneously. Turn and back at the same time. Which way is back, I said. Back, back towards the wall. Oh, the wall, okay, I said, but I couldn't get it right no matter what I did. It won't work, I said, and I began to sweat, and then I heard Selden. Philip? It's Selden. Why did you lock it? We weren't going to come in. I didn't say you were, I said. Then why did you lock it? I don't know, I said. Do you think we should call the fire department, Mom? They can get him out with a ladder. No, 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 Mrs. Wishnow said. Come on, Philip, Selden said. It's not that hard. But it is. It's stuck. How's he going to get out, Ma? Selden, be still. Philip? Yes, are you all right? Well, it's, it's hot in here. It's getting hot. Take a glass of cold water, dear. There's a glass in the medicine cabinet. Take a glass of water and slowly drink it and you'll be fine. Okay. But the glass had something slimy at the bottom, and though I took it out, I only pretended to drink from it and drank instead from my cupped hands. Ma, Selden said, what's he doing wrong? Philip, what are you doing wrong? How do I know, I said. Mrs. Wish now? Mrs. Wish now? Yes, dear. It's getting too hot in here. I'm really starting to sweat. Then open the window. Open the little window in the shower. Are you tall enough to do that? I think so. I took off my shoes and stepped into the shower in just my socks, and standing on my tiptoes, I was able to reach the window, a smallish window of pebble glass that looked onto the alleyway. But when I tried to open it, it was stuck, too. It won't go, I said. Bang it a little, dear. Bang the frame at the bottom, but not too hard, and I'm sure it will open. I did as she told me, but couldn't get it to budge. By now, my shirt was saturated with sweat, and so I angled myself to be able to give the window a good, strong shove upwards. But in turning, I must have struck the shower handle with my elbow because suddenly the water was on. Oh, no, I said, and ice-cold water was pouring over my head and down the back of my shirt, and I jumped out of the shower and onto the tile floor. What happened, dear? The shower started. How? Selden said. How could the shower start? I don't know. Are you very wet? She asked me. Sort of. Get a towel, she told me. Get a towel out of the closet. The towels are in the closet. We had the same narrow little bathroom closet directly upstairs over the Wishnow's bathroom closet, and we used it for towels, too, but when I went to open theirs, I couldn't. The door was stuck. I yanked, but it wouldn't open. What is it now, Philip? Nothing. I couldn't tell her. Did you take a towel? Yes. Then dry yourself off, and you must stay calm. There's nothing to worry about. I am calm. Sit down. Sit down and dry yourself off. I was soaking wet, and now the floor was getting wet, and I sat on the toilet seat, and that's when I saw a bathroom for what it is, the upper end of a sewer. And that's when I felt the tears begin to well up. Don't worry, Selden called into me. Your mother and father will be home soon. But how will I get out? And all at once the door was open, and there was Selden, and behind him his mother. How do you do that, I said. I opened the door, he said. But how? He shrugged. I pushed, I just pushed. It was open all the time. And that was when I began to bawl. And Mrs. Wishnow took me in her arms and said, That's okay. Things like this happen. They can happen to anyone. It was open, Ma, Selden said to her. Shh, she told him. Shh, doesn't matter. And then she came into the bathroom and turned off the cold water, which was still streaming into the tub. 
and without any problem she opened the closet door and took out a fresh towel and began to dry my hair and my face and my neck, all the while gently telling me that it didn't matter and that these things happen to people all the time. But that was long before everything else went wrong. The congressional campaign began at 8 a.m. the Tuesday after Labor Day with Walter Winchell up on a soapbox at Broadway and 42nd Street, the celebrated crossroads where he denounced his presidential candidacy from atop the very same genuine wooden soapbox and looking in broad daylight, exactly as press photos pictured him broadcasting from the NBC studio Sunday nights at 9, jacketless, in his shirt sleeves, with the cuffs rolled up and his tie yanked down and pushed back from his forehead, the hard-boiled newsman's fedora. Within only minutes, some half-dozen mounted New York City policemen were already needed to divert traffic away from the eager stream of working people charging onto the street to hear and see him in the flesh. And once word spread that the orator with the bullhorn wasn't just another Bible bore prophesying doom for sinful America, but the store club habitué, only recently the country's most influential radio broadcaster and the city's most nefarious tabloid journalist, the number of onlookers grew from the hundreds to the thousands. Nearly 10,000 people all told, said the papers, up from the subways and emptying out of the buses drawn by the maverick and his immoderation. The broadcasting cowards, he told them, and the billionaire publishing hooligans controlled from the White House by the Lindbergh gang say Winchell was canned for crying fire in a crowded theater. Mr. and Mrs. New York City, the word wasn't fire, it was fascism, Winchell cried, and it still is. Fascism. Fascism. And I will continue crying fascism to every crowd of Americans I can find until Herr Lindbergh's pro-Hitler party of treason is driven from the Congress on election day. The Hitlerites can take away my radio microphone, and they've done just that, as you know. They can take away my newspaper column, and they have done that, as you know. And when, God forbid, America goes fascist, Lindbergh's stormtroopers can lock me away in a concentration camp to shut me up, and they will do that too, as you know. They can even lock you away in a concentration camp to shut you up, and I hope by now that you damn well know that. But what our homegrown Hitlerites cannot take away is my love for America and yours, my love for democracy and yours, my love for freedom and yours. What they cannot take away unless the gullible and the sheepish and the terrified are patsies enough to return them to Washington one more time, is the power of the ballot box. The Hitlerite plot against America must be stopped and stopped by you, by you, Mr. and Mrs. New York, by the voting power of the freedom-loving people of this great city on Tuesday, November 3rd, 1942. All that day... September 8, 1942, and into the evening, Winchell climbed atop his soapbox in every neighborhood in Manhattan, from Wall Street, where he was largely ignored, to Little Italy, where he was shouted down, to Greenwich Village, where he was ridiculed, to the Garment District, where he was intermittently cheered, to the Upper West Side, where he was welcomed as their savior by the Roosevelt Jews, and eventually north to Harlem, where... In the crowd of several hundred Negroes who had gathered at dusk to hear him speak at the corner of Lenox Avenue and 125th Street, a few laughed and a handful applauded, but most remained respectfully dissatisfied, as though to work his way into their antipathies would require his delivering a very different spiel. It was difficult to ascertain the impact Winchell made on the voting public that day. To Winchell's former paper, Hearst's Daily Mirror, the ostensible effort to gather local grassroots support for routing the Republican Party from Congress nationwide looked more like a publicity stunt than anything else. A predictably egomaniacal publicity stunt by an unemployed gossip columnist who could not bear being out of the spotlight. And especially so, since not a single Democratic congressional candidate running for election in Manhattan chose to appear anywhere within hearing distance of the Winchell Bullhorn. If any candidates were out campaigning, they stayed far from wherever Winchell repeatedly committed the political blunder of associating the name of Adolf Hitler with that of an American president whose heroics the world still idolized, whose achievement even the Fuhrer respected, and whom an overwhelming majority of his countrymen 
continued to adore as their nation's godlike catalyst of peace and prosperity. In a brief sardonic editorial, at it again, the New York Times was able to reach but one conclusion about the latest of Winchell's self-serving shenanigans. There is nothing Walter Winchell has more talent for, wrote the Times, than himself. Winchell spent a full day in each of the other four boroughs of the city and the following week headed north to Connecticut. Though still in want of a Democratic candidate willing to wed a fledgling congressional campaign to his inflammatory rhetoric, Winchell went ahead to set up his soapbox outside the gates to the factories of Bridgeport and at the entrance to the shipyards in New London, where he pushed back his fedora, pulled down his tie and cried, fascism, fascism, into the face of the crowd. From Connecticut's industrial coast, he traveled north again to the working-class enclaves of Providence and then crossed from Rhode Island into the factory towns of southeastern Massachusetts, addressing tiny street-corner gatherings in Fall River, Brockton, and Quincy with no less fervor than he'd expended in his maiden speech in Times Square. From Quincy, he went on to Boston, where he planned to spend three days moving through Irish Dorchester in South Boston into the Italian North End. However, on his first afternoon at South Boston's busy Perkins Square, the few jeering hecklers who'd been baiting him as a Jew ever since his departing as native New York and his leaving behind there the police protection guaranteed him by Fiorello LaGuardia, the city's anti Lindbergh Republican mayor, burgeoned into a mob waving handmade placards reminiscent of the banners and signs beautifying the Bund rallies in Madison Square Garden. And the moment Winchell opened his mouth to speak, somebody brandishing a burning cross rushed toward the soapbox to set him aflame, and a gun was fired twice into the air, either as a signal from the organizers to the rioters, or as a warning to the marked man from New York, or as both. There, in the old brick cityscape of little family-run shops and streetcars and shade trees and small houses, each topped, back then before TV, only by the appendage of a towering chimney, in the Boston where the Depression had never ended, amid the storefront sacred to the American Main Street, the ice cream parlor, the barber shop, the pharmacy, and just up the way from the dark, spiky outline of St. Augustine's Church, thugs with clubs surged forward screaming, Kill him! And two weeks from its inception in New York's five boroughs, the Winchell campaign, as Winchell had imagined it, was underway. He had at last brought the Lindbergh grotesquerie to the surface the underside of Lindbergh's affable blandness, raw and undisguised. Though the Boston police did nothing to restrain the rioters, the gunshots had sounded a full hour before a squad car drove up to survey the scene. The plainclothes team of armed professional bodyguards, who'd been stationed at Winchell's side throughout the trip, managed to douse the flames consuming one of his trouser legs and having freed him from the first wave of the crowd after only a few blows had fallen, to lift him into a car parked just yards from the soapbox and drive him to Kearney Hospital on Telegraph Hill, where he was treated for facial wounds and minor burns. His first visitor at the hospital wasn't the mayor, Maurice Tobin, or Tobin's defeated mayoral rival, ex-governor James M. Curley, another FDR Democrat who, like the Democrat Tobin, wanted no part of Walter Winchell. Nor was it the local congressman, John W. McCormick, whose roughneck brother, a bartender known as Nako, presided over the neighborhood with as much authority as the popular Democratic representative. To everyone's surprise, beginning with Winchell himself, his first visitor was a patrician Republican of distinguished New England lineage, the two-term Massachusetts governor, Leverett Saltonstall. This ends Disc 8.